All right, so let me go ahead and introduce our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Hayo uh, Reinders. He is the Tesla Professor and Director of Research at Anaheim University in the USA. He's also a Professor of Applied Linguistics at uh, KMUTT in Thailand. He's a founder of the Global Institute for Teacher Leadership and editor of the Innovation in Language Teaching, uh, Language Learning and Teaching. And he's here uh, today to talk to us about supporting language learning beyond the classroom. So it's my great pleasure to welcome you on screen. Hayo, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome, thank you so much, Josh. And thank you everybody for joining. Uh, what a wonderful presentation we've just observed from the always amazing Tammy. Um, I know Tammy a little bit and I'm always impressed with her work. Um, and I'm impressed with all of you being here. So thank you so much for uh, turning up. Uh, this topic that we're going to be covering today is actually something that's really, really close to my heart. And I actually believe it ties in quite nicely with what Tammy was talking about. Um, and so, yeah, let's jump right into it. Um, for the last 25 years or so, I've been interested in learning beyond the classroom, uh, whether it's in the mountains in New Zealand or in my home country uh, in, in Holland. Uh, but it's a real area of, of passion and interest for me personally, but I think also in the last couple of years, um, many of us, all of us have sort of come to realize, if we didn't know this already, the enormous range of different learning spaces, as I like to call them, uh, that are available to, to our learners. And of course, by extension, also to us as teachers and kind of the, the personal, the, the political, the familial, the organizational, range of different learning environments that are available is just staggering. And today I want to kind of dive into that a little bit and look to see uh, how we can tap into that as teachers, how we can make the most of that. And before I do that, um, I think um, what I'm trying to kind of encourage all of us to do is to think about ways in which we can move from um, shall we say, a, a space and time where we've been relentlessly bombarded with change, you know, with continuous change, even before, of course, COVID, you know, as teachers, we're constantly being asked to change all sorts of things about our practice. And I think uh, I certainly have felt myself sometimes a little bit out of, out of touch with, with that. And I don't always feel that I am in control of the changes that are happening sometimes to me as the the great Michael Fullan, who, who you may have heard of, uh, an educational psychologist, said, you know, teachers don't mind change so much, but they, they really don't like it when they are being changed by others. And I think what we've seen in the last couple of years is plenty of change, but maybe not quite enough innovation. And, and this is a term that I really like, despite the fact that it's often used kind of, you know, haphazardly. But uh, for that reason, I just wanted to stop for a second and, and just talk about what this term actually means uh, to me. And I've adopted the, the definition by Delano, Riley and Crooks. And in a nutshell, what they say is that actually, you know, true innovation is first and foremost uh, an informed change. It's not something that we do or change about our practice kind of as, a, as a, a knee jerk reaction to an external force or a mandate or even something like a pandemic, but it's, it's an informed set of decisions. We've been able to reflect on it, think about it and make a careful kind of decision about what to do. And also importantly, what sometimes not to do. So innovation is first and foremost informed. And so that involves in, you know, involving teachers in the decision making process, which unfortunately in practice often doesn't happen. It also in, involves, as they describe it, um, a change in the underlying philosophy of language learning and teaching. When we talk about change here, we're not just describing how we painted the walls of the classroom in a different color but we are actually describing a process whereby each of us individually comes to learn and recognize something new or different about the ways in which we can support our learners. So a really kind of deep, um, shall we say, kind of development 
in ourselves as teachers. And that is what represents a true innovation. So what we've kind of done and seen over the last many, many years, including the last two years, is that we've essentially adopted a model of education um, that you could describe as traditional or formal instruction. And formal instruction is probably the type of instruction that most of us are most familiar with. And well, it, it has as some of its characteristics, uh, such things as being very predictable. It's very easy to plan, for example, what classes you're going to be teaching this semester, what's going to happen next Monday at nine o'clock, what's going to happen on Tuesday at two o'clock. Uh, and things like knowing what learners are going to be entering your classroom, what level they are, uh, what homework they've done, and so on. In other words, formal learning or formal instruction is very useful, very beneficial, uh, especially from an organizational point of view. So I, I certainly don't want to give anyone the impression that when I talk about uh, supporting learning beyond the classroom, that somehow I think that the classroom doesn't have a role to play. Quite the opposite, in fact, as I will show you. Now, as useful as formal instruction can be, it is, of course, only one of very many types of learning and, by extension, teaching that can take place. And in this graphic here that I put together a few months ago, I've kind of tried to bring together uh, the notion of different types of learning spaces. And the reason why I call it spaces, by the way, is that a place is usually has a connotation of being a physical environment like a classroom or a home, whereas a space can be you know, a virtual environment or it can be in the learner's, the learner's head. Um, I will give you a couple of examples of the range of learning spaces that are available to our learners and some examples of how these different environments can support different ways of learning. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, so I'll flag right now that at the end of the presentation I'll give you a link to a web page where you can download the presentation. Uh, and I've also put together for you some additional resources and some practical articles that I've written over the years on some of the ideas that I'll be sharing with you today. So if I don't get to touch on everything, you'll be able to follow up a little bit later. So let's look at a couple of examples, shall we? Of course, the most common one that all of us have experienced um, and have, have gone through in the last couple of years is the notion of remote learning, which of course for many of us was new in many ways. It certainly represented a change, but here's a question for you. To what extent did it represent for you an innovation in your teaching? I mean, there's no arguing that for many of us, our daily practice changed significantly from a face-to-face -face physical environment to an online environment, maybe sometimes a blended environment. But the extent to which we've been able to change the way that we teach our learners or support them to perhaps help themselves in other learning environments outside the familiar classroom is something that, well, I think we're still working on. And now is starting to become a really, really good time, a really exciting moment where all of us have had all sorts of experiences. And I think now the time is right to get to that point of, shall we say, going back to the definition of an informed change where we can say, okay, this is what's happened. This is what we've learned. Now let's take the best from that and keep it. And let's throw away everything else that didn't work for us and make sure that we, uh, that we truly innovate our practice. So in the case of remote learning, I would say that mostly we have simply adopted the formal instruction that happens in a physical environment and have simply copied and pasted it into a remote environment. And that has been, in some cases, quite successful, and in other cases, perhaps not. But the point here is that there are many, many other types of learning and other types of spaces. And as one example of that, the notion of flexible learning is something that you're possibly familiar with. The idea that learners, rather than teachers, 
choose when they need to learn something. And in a school environment or a university environment, uh, a common provision of flexible learning is the self-access center or the independent learning center or whatever it may be called in, in your institution, where the learner decides, hey, this is an area that I need more practice in, or this is something that I need more support with, let me go and find it. And so it's, it's shifting some of the responsibility and choice from the institution, from the teacher to the learner. Uh, by the way, in a corporate environment, flexible learning is probably the most uh, common type of formal instruction in that teams or heads of department or individual staff can say, you know, I, there's a new skill that I need um, and I need support around this. And then usually a CPD, a Center for Professional Development or similar will try and provide that. Now here is one that actually is really kind of fascinating because it's something that I think many of us haven't really heard about much. And it's the notion of performance support. And the reason why it's fascinating is that it's probably the most common type of learning at least for adult learners in the world. So what is it? Well, performance support is the help that you get while you are carrying out performing a particular job. You can see in the image, uh, maybe it's a bit small, but you can see there's somebody digging up the road, right? A road worker, maybe, uh, you know, he's, he's digging up a, a place to put a new pipe and he's run into a problem of some sort. Maybe he doesn't know where the pipe needs to go, or maybe he doesn't know where the wires are or things like that. And there's somebody standing next to him with a laptop. And so this is an example of I'm doing a job and it can be something as simple as, as carrying out road works. And at that moment in time, I need to learn something. And at that moment in time, you know, this is called just in time, I need the learning support. And in the literature that's referred to as performance support. Quite an interesting notion, uh, if you think about it, considering how common it actually is. Now here's one that I'm really interested in myself and have been for a number of years, and that's the idea of game-based learning. Um, I don't probably need to tell you how many, many of our learners love playing games, uh, including digital games, and well, um, the, the, the space in which that takes place has a tremendous amount of opportunity for learning, including language learning. And I'll show you an example of that in a moment. There are many more, like informal learning, non-formal learning, mentor-based learning, self-directed learning, peer learning, many terms which you've probably come across over the years. But the point here is that, well, there is a tremendous range of opportunities for learning available to our learners that sit outside of the formal instructional uh, environment that most of us are familiar with. And well, as um, Cross here indicates, it's quite likely that up to 70 or 80% of adult learning actually takes place outside of formal education. And that leads to an important question. You know, what do we do as teachers to support that and to prepare our learners for their future learning beyond the classroom? And you might say, well, most of my students are quite young. They're in school and so they're you know, going to their primary or high school every day. But even then, this figure here reminds us that out of the 24 hours a day, and if you look at the entire lifespan of a learner, a really small percentage in terms of the hours is actually spent in the school environment. And so even if you are teaching students in compulsory education, for example, well, there's a lot of time that they have where they interact with family, with friends, in church, at mosque, um, you know, in community spaces uh, that we can draw. And there's a lot of time where learners not just do homework, but simply also process what they've encountered, for example, in the classroom. So the notion here um, behind the theoretical idea behind all of these types of learning is not simply that, well, it happens, it's common, so we, we, we better try and figure out how to make use of it. But 
I actually look at it in a much more positive way in the sense that many of these types of learning that fall outside this, shall we say, traditional formal model are incredibly powerful means of learning. In fact, some of the most powerful means of learning. And this is not just a, uh, a statement that I make lightly. There is a huge body of research that has described, investigated, researched over, the, over many decades now, the benefits, the, the huge advantages of, for example, uh, social learning or learning that is situated, learning that happens in a particular in a particular space in time, you know, if you have an encounter with someone and something special happens, whatever occurred in that situation, you will remember much better than if uh, it just happened in a textbook or in the classroom, because you also remember the room where it happened in, you remember the weather, you remember how you felt at the time. And that's because, well, we are human beings, not just learners, right? So we learn in social ways, we learn in particular situations, we learn through our experiences. Um, we learn because it's something is important to us personally, not just because it's in the curriculum. So um, I'm not gonna talk about the theories uh, behind learning beyond the classroom here, but uh, these, these resources here, uh, some of which I've written, some of which other people have written, you know, are a good introductory point if you wanted to learn more about this. But the key point I want to make here is, is quite a powerful one. I think most of us for many years have been aware of the need to prepare our learners for lifelong learning, right? Um, you know, I think it's now very widely, if not, you know, universally accepted that as teachers, we don't just teach the language. We also teach learners uh, how to continue to learn and improve by themselves in the future. But there's another component to that which is not receiving as much intention, and that is that lifelong learning is complemented by life-wide learning. In other words, all the things that we do in our daily lives, not just in school, but also in our personal lives. So the question then becomes, how do we take that into account when we teach. And I want to share with you just some examples. And again, on the final slide, I'll share with you uh, some resources uh, where you can read up some of the, these ideas in, in more detail uh, than I can go into uh, it here. But uh, I wanted to uh, share with you um, the, the benefits that I've experienced in my teaching of digital gaming. Um, and I want to very briefly tell you about a project that Nuta um, Krita uh, and I did in Thailand a few years ago on using digital games to support engineering students in uh, a university in Bangkok. And as you can imagine, uh, a lot of these learners had very little interest, very little motivation really in learning English. They're students of engineering, their primary interest was in engineering, but well, the university makes it compulsory for students to take classes in English, and so, well, they had to show up. <laughs> but as Nuta Krita, my colleague, pointed out, it was really, really hard to get them to participate, and a big problem, uh, especially maybe in Thailand, but I've not noticed it also in other countries, is that learners feel very shy, very reluctant to speak out, you know, very inconfident, and they prefer to just be quiet. Now, when we talk to them and, and we ask them questions about you know, why that was and the kinds of things that they enjoyed doing and what they liked about English maybe and you know, in general, we found out very quickly that many of them were very actively playing computer games, sometimes almost on a daily basis. Uh, and we thought, well, maybe we can extend the, the, the learning space of the classroom to incorporate this space in the digital gaming environment. And that's exactly what we ended up doing. Uh, as I said, it's a few years ago, there was a game that was popular at the time called Ragnarok. I, I think it's still around, but it's an online role-playing game. You could substitute what I'm talking about here with anything that is available now, like you know, Age of Civilization or whatever game that you or your learners 
might be familiar with. But the point of an online role-playing game is, first of all, it's online. So you play with people from different places, different countries. And secondly, it's a role-playing game. So you are not actually yourself. You are playing the role of a wizard or a knight or something like that. So we told our learners, in this class, you are allowed to play computer games. And at first they wouldn't believe us and they said, really? Are we still getting credit for this? <laughs> and we said, yep, absolutely. But there are two rules you have to follow. Firstly, you have to tune in to the English international server of this game. You can't log into the local Thai server, you have to play the international version, which meant that all of the, the texting and everything, voice chatting and, and typed texting, now had to take place in English. And secondly, we gave them some specific instructions and we told them, we gave them a number of in, in language teaching uh, parlance, we gave them some specific tasks. We told them to, for example, go and find information and speak to other players and find out where, you know, I can't remember, where the treasure is hidden or things like that. Now, as teachers, you'll probably recognize immediately that these kinds of instructions almost force learners to communicate and exchange information uh, and discuss and figure out problems with other players. In other words, it almost requires you to communicate quite frequently. And so you might ask, well, how did that go? How did the learners respond to that? And I'm not going to give you all the details of the study. Again, it's in the references if you're interested in reading about it. It is quite fascinating, but probably the most interesting finding that we observed, something that really excited us was that these shy, inconfident, almost anxious learners who were very, very reluctant to speak in English increased in willingness to communicate over a period of one semester dramatically. I can give you the statistical details, contact me later if you're interested, but a really significant improvement in their, as the literature describes it, their readiness their willingness, their ability to engage in the target language, in this case, English language communication in a particular situation. And when we talked to learners afterwards and interviewed them, they said things like, well, I wasn't, I wasn't scared anymore. I wasn't, I wasn't so anxious because, well, it's not me. It's just the character on the screen. So why am I sharing this example with you? Simply because it is one way of getting learners to feel more comfortable and to feel that you are listening to the things that they enjoy doing and then make an attempt to bring that into your classroom. In other words, you are saying your spaces, your social or computer or whatever spaces can become a part of our total space. Another example of that, and a very, very easy one that I think most of us are familiar with, is the, the idea of using uh, back channels. Now, for those of you not familiar with the term, a back channel is essentially providing your learners with an opportunity, an additional opportunity to communicate with you. You know, like in a traditional classroom, especially a face-to-face -face environment, a learner has to be really quite, well, quite confident and brave to put up their hand and say, sorry, teacher, I don't understand what you're saying. Can you please explain that again, right? And well, the most outgoing, active, extrovert, confident learners will happily do that. But how many of your learners don't? And how many sit there thinking, I wish somebody else would ask a question, right? Well, if you offer your learners alternative ways of communicating with you, then suddenly it opens up the opportunity, the possibility for them to let you know things like, you're going too fast, you're going too slow. I don't understand this, right? Now, the apps that I have included at the bottom, these are just some examples. You know, there are hundreds 
and your school, your university may have access to different ones and you may know of other ones that you think are better. I think all of these have good points and all of them have, you know, less good points. Uh, so I'm not suggesting that these are the apps to use, but what they have in common is that they each try to find a way to let learners speak up, right? And so what you see in practice and the research shows this very, very clearly that learners are suddenly able to feel a lot more free to let their voices be heard. And I'm not just talking about letting the teacher know that they have a problem, but also just simply sharing what they feel, what they think, what they would like to learn more about. You know, this is going back to what Tammy, Tammy Gregerson was saying in the presentation before this, you know, just giving your learners the opportunity to voice, to express themselves, even if they don't necessarily always have the language to do so. And so what you see in these types of environments is that one learner may ask a question and type in something like, you know, I don't get this. And another learner will already respond before the teacher can even, you know, or even needs to reply to that, right? And well, again, another example of some of these apps is, is functions like polling and quizzes and, and ranking, you know, where you say as a teacher, well, how many of you get this? You know, is, is this okay? Do you, on a scale of one to five, how well do you understand the topic that we just talked about, right? And if you get an average of 4.5, then well, probably it's time to move on. But if the average is 2.5, you probably want to go back over that. And at the end of the class, you might look at the results and say, well, the average was 4.5, but I had two learners who said that they only felt they kind of understood the topic at the level of one out of five. Let me go and follow up with these students, right? And this is something that you can do in a physical classroom, especially if your learners, if your learners have access to a cell phone or a tablet, or if they can share one between them, um, or in an online environment. But the point is opening up additional alternative opportunities for learners to share. Another example of that, something that I've been experimenting with for about 10 years now, and something that is probably one of my favorite activities in class is the, the use of digital storytelling. Um, I don't need to tell you about storytelling and the power of storytelling because we all grew up as, as children, as babies, you know, being told stories by our parents and you all know the incredible power of stories, right? We remember stories, not so much facts and details. We remember, you know, the, the, the characters and, and their passions and, and the adventures that they had. Uh, and that applies to our learners too, not just to, to us, right? So storytelling in general is a, a fascinating activity to use in class. Digital storytelling adds a few more benefits. And one of them is that it gives learners uh, a range of tools to tell their story using media that they enjoy and are familiar with. So a digital story can include audio, video, anime, graphics, photos you've taken, poetry, uh, interviews, all sorts of sources could be included in creating a story. Now, especially if you teach learners who are beginner level or, or not quite proficient, they don't have the verbal or written proficiency yet to really express what they feel, right? Um, but allowing them to augment, to enhance their stories by using additional sources, whether it's a TikTok video or YouTube clip or some music that they've created or whatever, suddenly gives them a whole orchestra of instruments to express who they are and what they enjoy. And so the notion of storytelling, and if you just type, you know, digital storytelling and education into Google, you'll find lots of apps and tools that, that uh, and many of them free, by the way, that you can use. Uh, and also, if you look through the references that I will give you later, you can find some articles I've written on the topic. But the reason why I included this particular uh, example is that, again, it gives your learners a voice. It, it tells them and actually invites them to share the spaces that they occupy outside of the classroom with you and bring that 
to the classroom, which can be extremely motivating, right? Um, I was once at a, at a conference um, where um, there was a very famous psychologist uh, speaker, um, David Gardner, the famous David Gardner from the, the, the motivation um, theories. Um, you know, so he's not a language educator, but a, an educational psychologist. And he said, well, you know, if you really, really push me and ask me what is the one thing that predicts whether or not um, an environment like a, a school or a classroom or a group of learners will be successful or not, it's their answers to this one simple question. And the question that he said was, my teacher likes me or my teacher cares about me right if the learners in a group say yes yeah that, that that's the case for me my teacher really cares about me she really likes me right that is directly correlated with that learner that community being successful and that's fascinating now i know many of us most of us, I should say, really deeply care about our learners, but how are you showing it to your learners and how are you inviting them to share who they are, not just as learners, but as people with you? It's a very powerful and fascinating question. And there are many ways in which technology can help us to recognize our learners. So for example, apps like Class Dojo and Kahoot and Seesaw, and again, there's so many of them, you know, and they're all good in some ways and not so good in others. But one of the ways in which we can use them is recognize when our learners are being creative or when they're working well together uh, or when they are being kind to each other, right? And so, for example, with Class Dojo, you know, as a teacher, you'd have a, a, a tablet or a phone or something at the front of the room and you observe some behavior which may not even have anything directly to do with language learning, but you see something that you think is good, it's nice, that you want to encourage. Well, using apps like this, you can click on that learner on your screen and give that learner you know, a compliment or a point or whatever that particular app may allow you to do. So the learner recognizes, it feels that you recognize what they do and how they try to be an active, positive, contributor to the community. So what I want to finish off with is to give you some a bit of a framework, shall we say, to how you could incorporate uh, this notion of supporting learning beyond the classroom in your teaching. Because, well, it's not a short term um, activity. This is not something that you do one day and then forget about. If you want to help your learners to become comfortable and confident and competent in learning beyond the classroom, um, well, that takes time. We need to gradually um, prepare our learners for both lifelong and life-wide learning. And the way that I think of it when I think of a curriculum or my classes is that I start from an e what I call an ecological approach. And that is just thinking of my learners as well as human beings and, and as a community uh, rather than as a group of learners. And what I recognize is that learners essentially have two, in, in, in practice often quite separate environments or spaces that they operate in. They have the things that happen in class and then there's all the other stuff that happens outside class and the challenge for us is how we can bring these two together and so the approach that I found works well is a gradual one and it's really simple and common sense but it, it consists of four steps you don't just jump in one day suddenly and say today is learning beyond the classroom day you're all autonomous learners go ahead and do whatever you like and you know, good luck. <laughs> and I've tried that in the past and it doesn't work, right? So learners need, need, need guidance, they need support, they need feedback, they need training, they need help. And so it really starts from something as simple as raising awareness, you know, just encouraging learners to think about the fact that learning can and does take place outside the classroom. And it can be as simple as 
reminding learners that when they watch TV, that they might want to turn on the English subtitles or that they might want to switch to the English audio only, or that when they listen to music, that they might want to listen or read the, the lyrics for the songs that they enjoy. So it's really just as simple as planting a seed, you know, it's just getting learners to recognize that, hey, you know, maybe there are things that I don't need to wait for my teacher for. The second stage is a little bit more serious. Now we're going to actually do an activity in class where we're going to prepare an activity that you will carry out beyond the classroom. So this is still very safe. You know, we're, I'm not asking you to do something scary. We're just doing it in the, the comfort and the safety of our classroom. Uh, and maybe I'm going to ask you to, let me think of an example. Or maybe one day uh, I'm going to ask you to interview uh, a native speaker of English. Okay. Now in class, what we might do is we might have a conversation about, well, what does that involve? What do you need to know and what do you need to be able to do to interview a native speaker? Well, things like you need to know how to approach someone. You're not just going to randomly walk up to someone and put a microphone in their face. You know, you need to have communication strategies and you need to ask permission and you need to know what kind of language to use to ask questions and so on. So in class, what we would do is an activity whereby I, as the teacher, uh, would maybe do role plays or have learners practice this together, provide them with language, linguistic examples of useful expressions, and where we would practice that safely, constantly giving feedback to the learners. Now, it's only when I feel that learners are developing some sense of confidence and competence that I will give them some sort of an assignment to actually carry out an activity beyond the classroom. Now, depending on the age of your learners that might be out in the community or it might be in a different classroom down the hall, but at least away from your everyday teaching environment. But I will give them support. I will give them specific instructions and ideas. I might give them a template. Uh, I might give them a model interview. Um, I might show them some videos of a successful student who's done something like that in the past. So I provide them with a lot of support. And if they are doing it and they run into trouble, I will be available via email or, or WhatsApp or whatever to help them. So in other words, it's a step up, but I'm still there supporting them. And then the final stage is where I will say, okay, you now have some skills to learn beyond the classroom. Why don't you go and you choose what it is that you would like to do? How can you involve some of your activities, some of the things you enjoy, some of the spaces that you occupy outside of school in your own learning? And what I ask them to do is to report that back to everyone in the class so that everybody can get ideas. And so we can all be encouraged back down to the bottom to try out new things and get new ideas. And I will use that opportunity to give feedback and, and let the student know that they are always being supported. So it's simple. It's a simple model, but in a lot of cases, we kind of forget that learners need that careful um, scaffolding to get to the stage where they can actually learn um, successfully outside of the classroom. And related to that, um, learners also need to have some very, very specific strategies or self-directed learning skills to, to manage that self-directed learning process. And I've written about this in the past, and again, this is on your, your handout. Um, and well, one practical way to think about it is to think of it as a cycle of self-directed learning stages, essentially, that when you or learner is engaged in learning beyond the classroom, there are some specific uh, learning related decisions that they have to make. Now, starting from 9 p.m. on the clock here, the first one is they will need to figure out what it is that they need to learn, right? Now, in formal education, especially in the early years, almost always are learners being told what they need Right? They're tested, they are giving a diagnosis, they're giving a placement test, what have you, and then the teacher or the school will tell them, this is, this is what you need. But over time, if we really want to prepare our learners for being able to make decisions about their own learning, 
Well, one of the first things I need to learn is how to identify what they need and what they don't need. Um, and for example, moving from high school to university or from university to the workplace or changing from one job to another, well, our needs change continuously throughout our lives. And unless we are shown how to think about that and make meaningful decisions, most learners don't know how to consider that and maybe make a new learning plan. And here's an interesting one. Um, in my own research, I have found, I'm sure you've observed something similar in your learners, is that many students have very little sense of how to make a, a well-structured, meaningful and reasonable learning plan. You know, sometimes learners have a burst of energy and motivation and they design this learning plan where they say that they're going to be studying for, for 25 hours a day, for eight days a week, right? Or, or the plan that they make just doesn't match the needs that they have. Well, it's a skill, right? Uh, it's a skill to know to draft a good plan that matches your needs. And it's a skill that many of us have because, well, we are teachers and we studied this, but our learners don't. But the good thing is that it's not that difficult to remind your learners and to give them some kind of useful advice, like, you know, make sure when you're studying that you have a system, you know, but keep it simple. Don't make it too complicated, right? But having a system and sticking to it is far more important than trying to study for 10 hours nonstop or something like that. So the advice can be pretty commonsensical, but it does need to be given. And then the final one here that I want to briefly mention is the idea of monitoring progress. Again, in a formal instructional context, it's always someone else who tells you whether you're doing well or not. It's the test, it's the end of semester exam, it's the, the assignment feedback that you receive. But really, lifelong and life-wide learning require us to have the tools to figure out whether what we've spent so much time on improving has actually paid off, right? So being able to self-assess or peer assess or ask yourself reflective questions, you know, things like, how did that go? Or how could I do it differently? Or what could I try next time? These are powerful questions that if we show them and demonstrate them and practice them with our learners can make a tremendous difference to them in the future. So what I want to leave you with uh, before we open up for Q&A um, is, is some reflective questions. And, and these are really fairly broad because, of course, all of our contexts are different. But the first is just to encourage you to think about the types of learning spaces that your learners have available to them. So forget about the school, forget about your class, the curriculum. Think about the learners and their lives. What kinds of environments do they operate in and what kinds of potential is there in those spaces for language learning? And what could you do to make a connection with that to the classroom and encourage, prepare, support, and involve that type of learning uh, in the curriculum? And the final one, how could you bring learners' experiences as, as human beings, not just as learners, into the learning environment, into the learning space? Because it creates such a, such a, a motivating and, and aspirational environment. So really, to sum it all up, this slide kind of brings it together. In many cases, our learners feel that their daily lives and whatever they learn are separated. And well, I guess our challenge is to find ways to bring them together, for example, using some of the technologies that we have become more familiar with uh, over the last few years. Um, as I said to you, I've put together a link uh, and maybe, Josh, you can type this into the, the chat window as well, uh, where you can download this presentation. It will also be sent to you by the lovely people at OUP uh, very soon. Um, but if you go to innovationandteaching.org, that's my main website, and you can read articles and things like that. And if you add the forward slash ltalk.php, it will take you straight to a page where I've put together some additional reading materials and some examples and uh, as well as the, the presentation, the PDF file for the presentation. So I will leave it at that and let's open it up to uh, your questions. Josh, over to you. 
All right, thank you, Hayao. Um, I'll go ahead and read off a few of the questions because I think you're probably a bit distant from your monitor. Yeah, great. Okay, so um, we've got loads of questions. The, the overwhelming number one question that everyone has asked is, what technology are you using to deliver this presentation? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the secret sauce. Uh, <laughs> uh, what I didn't say, actually, in all uh, seriousness, is, is please feel free to contact me using any of these uh, mediums that I've put on the PowerPoint. I'd love to hear from you, including practical questions like this. So whatever we don't get to hear, feel free to just reach out to me directly. I've got a whole studio set up here at home. Two years ago, uh, I was already teaching uh, online a lot. Uh, working for Anaheim University, which is an online university. But then, of course, two years ago, I decided, okay, this is this is going to last a while. So I, I set up a, a huge green screen and multiple lights and things like that. But there is much cheaper and easier and simpler ways to achieve 90% of, of this. So if you're interested, just contact me and I'll be happy to share, share my secrets with you. Great, great. Thank you. All right, um, let's get to some questions about the content of the presentation. So we had one on... Um, getting students involved in independent learning. So independent learning is a, a crucial thing in learning beyond the classroom. So how can we get our students involved and invested in learning independently? I think there's, there's two broad components. One is, is um, awareness raising and the other is the practical skills, the, the pedagogical skills. This, when I say pedagogical in this context, I mean uh, learners ability to manage their own learning. So autonomous skills. The awareness raising relates to making learners understand that um, you're only there temporarily. You know, even if you're a primary school teacher and, and you have the same students five days a week, 40 weeks a year, well, next year they're going to have another teacher and in a few years they're going to be in high school and everything will change again. So making learners see the incredible importance of learning to figure out how to, how to manage their own learning it's probably the most important thing you can do. I mean, the worst thing you can, you can, that I've observed is, is students coming from high school to university having no anticipation of the freedom uh, that they have and, and the downsides of that and having no skills to figure out how to now look after themselves essentially. So that's, that's the, the first step. And the second step is, well, as I said, you know, encouraging, supporting, encouraging, preparing, supporting, involving try and gradually build in activities into your into your curriculum uh, or even just use the existing activities but see if you can expand them extend them where you ask learners to i don't know find some information from outside the textbook or relate some experiences that they've had in their own daily lives but every one of these types of activities you are you are emphasizing the importance of what learners do themselves. So as I said, it is a gradual process. This is this is something, especially with younger, younger learners, you're looking at, at a year, two years, three years, you know, with all the learners, you can compress this a little bit, but whatever you do, it will have a beneficial impact because it all adds to learners recognizing that they themselves ultimately are responsible for their own learning. Great, thanks, thanks for that answer. Um, all right, let's take another question. So we've got one on how can schools or institutions uh, make parents understand that notion of learning spaces as an essential aspect of real world learning? Yeah, that's an excellent point. Uh, we've, I've heard from, from colleagues who, for example, experimented with digital games and had very negative uh, negative situations where parents, you know, especially of younger learners came to them and said, you know, why are you telling my students to, or my, my children to play computer games? They're already on the computer too much. You know, what are you doing? <laughs> um, and, and I guess the, the lesson in that uh, is that actually, uh, you know, it's not just that it's helpful to link what happens outside the class with the classroom, but in some ways you have to, if you do expand beyond the classroom. <clears throat> and so, for example, parents are a fantastic resource so you need to include them because the parents are part of the community, the learning space outside the classroom, right? Especially for younger learners. And so, you know, thinking about the learning ecology, as I called it, the ecological approach, not just as, as the classroom and maybe some activities outside that, but you know, the whole kind of 
ecological space, including the parents, the, your colleagues, other teachers, the learners, their friends, their family, how can we involve them in the learning process? And in one of the examples that I just mentioned, that particular teacher sat down with the parents and said, you know, this is what I'm trying to do. This is why I'm doing it. This is my rationale. And the parents went, okay, we can see why this could be helpful. And we can see this now. And then the teacher said, how can you help me to make sure that, for example, when your children play computer games that say they play it in English rather than in their local language. And so now suddenly it became a, a partnership. You know what I mean? It's no longer just a teacher saying this is how it's going to be, but it became a lot more collaborative. So think of the community in all of its components and, and ask yourself, how can I bring that to the classroom and, and, and have a two way connection established there? Great. Thank you for that. Um, all right, let's take another question. We've got loads of questions here to look through. Um, how about this one? Um, in so much as teachers uh, love to expose learners to the outside world, uh, learning spaces are now quite limited in this new normal we live in. So how can teachers maximize learning spaces um, within the, the pandemic that we're, we're still in? Yeah, I, I sort of understand what, what you mean, and, and I agree with that. On the other hand, um, there are a lot of learning opportunities and learning spaces that are online. They're not always ideal. Having said that, there are also, of course, opportunities online that don't exist in the real world. Um, and I think it's, it's a little bit of a, a mixture between, between the two. I mean, you wouldn't send, for example, a six-year-old out into the city um, to, you know, interview strangers <laughs> for obvious reasons. But using the right technology and the right tools, you could do something like that in an online environment. Uh, let's also not forget that a lot of the learning spaces that we talk about are virtual spaces. Uh, you now, you may, you may approve of that and you may participate in them yourself, or maybe, maybe you don't. But the fact of the matter is that for a lot of our learners, that is their, that is their part of their reality. So although it is challenging that we can't draw on some of the physical experiences um, I think, well, the short answer is we have to make do with, with what is out there. And I think the, the opportunity in it, at least, is that it's forcing us to think a little bit more creatively about how we can use some of these online uh, environments and, and continue to use them in the future, in, into the future. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right, let's see. We've got more questions here. How about... Speaking of younger learners, I don't know how much experience you have, but um, how can we bring these type of flexible learning ideas to young learners, you know, around six years old or, or that age? Yeah, absolutely. This is great. I, uh, I have little experience teaching young children myself. I have a little bit of experience and it taught me, first and foremost, how much respect to have for people who teach younger learners because, well, you know, seriously, <laughs> you are amazing. Um, but yeah, so one of the interesting experiences that I've um, observed myself, uh, and that also comes out clearly from, from the literature on, for example, learner autonomy, is that there really isn't a, a, a lower age, a lower threshold below which you shouldn't teach learners about autonomy and about making their own decisions. There, there really isn't. I mean, Lenny Dunn, for example, from Denmark, has been working with children as young as four and five uh, even pre-primary and primary school learners for decades now, very, very successfully. So a lot of the ideas that we talk about here, the notion is is certainly applicable. Now, the way that you would do it in class obviously would be, would be different and you probably would do it more gradually and you would use different tools. But the earlier you start to encourage learners, including young learners, to recognize that well, you know, they can't always come running to you because one day they're going to have to figure it out themselves, the better, right? And I think one of the one of the, the benefits that we've seen of, of this explosion of tools and apps and so on that we've that we have become available, that some of them are really helpful. They're really good for supporting that sort of process. As one quick example, my daughter is nine years old. From when she was six, she started using an app called Seesaw, which you may or may not have heard of. It's a little bit similar to Class Dojo or Kahoot, I guess. But the thing is, it's, it's an online portfolio. And from the age of six, she was encouraged to write down what she had learned and her reflections on that. 
And I, as a parent and my wife, we can see during the day even what she's written and what she's posted. It could be images, pictures, drawings, and we can respond to that during the day. So it's a really nice way of linking what is usually a closed kind of classroom. I don't know what happens between nine o'clock and four o'clock. And now suddenly opening that, that up, but also more importantly, from the age of six or seven, she started recognizing, hey, this is this portfolio. This is my learning. This is what I have done. This is not the teacher. This is not my school. And when she went from, you know, six years to seven years or from one class to the next, she takes her portfolio with her. And so she feels this responsibility and this pride in her own in her own learning. So I think there's there's certainly a lot of a lot of potential there to work with learners from as early an age as is uh, possible. Great, great. Thanks. Thanks for that answer. All right, we've got time for a couple more. Um, this one is on how are the learning spaces that you explored and lifelong learning related? Yeah, that's an excellent question, actually, because the notion of life, I mean, lifelong learning has been around for a long, long time. Life wide learning is a relatively obscure term that I really like. Um, and to my mind, you, it's very difficult to teach learners lifelong learning, because, especially younger learners, because it's difficult to have an idea of what's going to happen in five years when you're in high school or in 10 years when you are at university, right? Uh, but life-wide learning is, of course, very, very practical because it's, you know, the playground that, that you as a child go to uh, after school or it's the, the, the church or the mosque or whatever that you visit on the weekend. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's now, it's real, it's where my friends are, it's where my family is. And if you can make a connection between those spaces and say, well, these are the spaces that will be around for you throughout your life, you know, these communities, you know, your friends or colleagues, depending on the age of your learners, uh, your family, your communities, these are the types of structures that, that you will uh, participate in for the rest of your life. I think that's a really, really nice and powerful and, and personal way into this notion of lifelong learning. I think lifelong learning on its own is perhaps, especially for younger learners, too difficult of a concept to really grasp. But if you combine the two, then suddenly I think it can really kind of um, make it make it uh, something a lot more realistic. Yep, yep, great. Thanks for that. Um, all right, we've got time for one more. We've only got a minute or two, so I don't know if you can tackle this entire question within that time, but I'll maybe I'm I'll ready. give you a challenge. So uh, why do you think uh, curricular designers, particularly government and boards of um, education, etc., cetera, um, avoid being innovative in their lesson planning and kind of ignoring teachers' experience in the planning process? What a beautiful question to end on. And the answer is very simple. And I mean this sincerely because they don't listen to teachers enough. And I think the last two years have shown that to us very, very clearly. No policymakers, no ministries of education, no general educational board had the answers, had any general idea of what to do in response to all the changes that we saw. It was teachers on the ground. It was us who had to respond in on the spot as quickly as possible, as best as we could. We rallied together. We, we, we did the very best that we could. And I think teachers have shown to be incredibly resilient and incredibly smart. And I think we better start listening to teachers a lot more. Right. Great way to end the, the talk. Well, that's that's all the time we have. That's all the questions we could take. Sorry, we couldn't get to everything. But thank you again, Hayo, for the wonderful presentation. Um, I'm, sh I'm sure everyone enjoyed it immensely. Um, so thanks again, Hayo. And thank you, Josh. Are... Thanks, everybody.